Jank. That was me catching it. You tossed it to me at the end of your last video, and I just, I just caught it. It's late. I'm late. I'm on some serious CP time and responding to you. So apologies to all the commenters down there, because that's normally where you are. To you, Jank, it's uh, been seven days since you posted your update. And I did not mean for full weeks to go by between us, but things have been a little hectic. So I appreciate your patience, and now I'm back. First, a comment on your whole production setup thing. Uh, I didn't know it was supposed to be like this. You have, and I'm gonna see if I can embed an image of you like now. So hopefully you guys are looking at Jank. Uh, check this dude out. He has a, a desk, right, where his arms can sit very professional. Like he's got a blazer, he's got a jacket, very clean, very clean, a haircut. Clearly, I just I just got one done. And uh, you have a whole backdrop going on behind you with like, you know, you're in a studio. Dude, I'm at home. I am clearly at home. That is that is my Obama Hope poster. That is a pile of bills right there, which I am avoiding uh, like AIG, all right, because I'm hoping to get some billions. And so I just wanted to point out that you have more institutional support in this conversation than me. And when I say institutional, I mean it in that way. All right, so let's get back to uh, our discussion and, and your points. Uh, seems like the main point you were making is don't label something as racist. Uh, because it puts people off and you can't have the discussion. Instead, call it questionable and ask if someone could see how this might be racist. I see where you're going. I don't think that quite gets us to where we need to be, however, because I think there's a certain privilege. Because you, you also said this. You said uh, white people are the target audience, right? Uh, and especially white people who don't think they're racist are the target audience. So you can't push them away, or you won't really have the meaningful discussion that we need. And I do hear what you're saying, but I think there is a limit to that approach. And the limit is this. Uh, there's a certain privilege to saying, we can't talk about this until this one group over here feels really comfortable and safe about the discussion. Otherwise, there's just not going to be any discussion. Right, because they're they're scared, they're skittish, they're run off. I don't want to be called racist. Ah, la, 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 I don't want to hear. It. La, 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 la. <laughs> so I I hear it. I uh, the concern is real, but I don't think that's the constructive path because the downside is you don't call out things that are racist. Period. And you're worried of people of color worried about stepping on eggshells, comforting a group of people. Uh, not all white people. I think you know. I want to simplify. We're not uh, clarify. We're not talking about all white people here, but uh, the idea that the concern about white people's feelings and sentiment should be preeminent is a concern upon which this whole country was based and is part of what got us here. Uh, do you see what I'm saying there? So, so that, that was the one thing. Uh, I wanted to also uh, add that there's a certain level of fatigue set in when taking that approach. Like I've been, I grew up around black people and Latino people mostly first. Then I went to private school and I had this whole like education of the black experience. I have a whole joke about like I should write a Negropedia, the comprehensive guide to all black knowledge for the edification of white folks. Like I probably should write that book in a humorous and insightful and engaging way. But until then, understand that part of what I'm communicating is fatigue. And it's not just my personal fatigue. I think it's generational fatigue handed down over hundreds of years of like, okay, here's how we have to approach it. We don't want to piss the white people off too much. And you know, we should be able to be more open uh, about it. And on that point, I think Valkyrie 607 on Huffington Post had a really interesting point, which is, uh, Jenk, what you're trying to do, and I'm fusing that person's point with my own, you're trying to make sure that we can actually have a constructive conversation so people are actually at the table and not running away, afraid of being called racist. I think that's accurate. I get that. I don't think the way to do that is to not call things out as racist. I think we need to be more comfortable with the idea that there is racist stuff out there. Still, that I'm a little racist myself, that you're a little racist, that we, our whole society is kind of infused with this. And that's how we sort of disarm the tension in the dialogue, not by avoiding the term, but actually rather by embracing it by acknowledging that this is a real thing. And one of the ways we do that, this is a bigger, longer term history, but I still point back to this idea that it's got to be a lot more work done by white people on some of this stuff. Uh, a lot of the reason we can't have the conversations that the basic information and education isn't there. Folks don't actually know the real history 
And so we're living on this myth that America's always been merit-based and land of the free and home of the brave and all that. And that's not quite the case all the time. I'm very animated tonight. I'm tired, but I'm animated. So I think if we're able to acknowledge that, yes, racism is everywhere. Yes, we're all a little bit racist, that it breaks down these certain ways. We can do that if we have a much more common foundation. Oh, you like that? Much more common foundation for understanding what that past uh, is. So that's what I would argue needs to happen more. It's not a fully concrete suggestion, but it is a bit of a rejection of your approach, which is call it questionable, reasonable doubt, criminal standards. I think that's a little too scientific, a little too technical for a lot of what's actually happening here, which is like social and historic and all those other fun words. Two other points I want to throw in just for fun. Maybe it'll take us in a different direction because we're not really talking about the cartoon anymore. And I'm glad we'll kind of move out of that. There are other things going on that we haven't addressed and maybe we could pick it up. One is how do we talk uh, about class in this context of the racial dialogue that needs to happen? It's such an important contributor. and I often leave it out. I know everybody who talks about race gets criticized for leaving it out too. How do we address the fact that this is not just a black white thing? And I, and I don't think we've done that, but it's easy to slip back into that, especially in talking from U.S. terms, black people, white people, and that's it. And obviously, there's more than that. Your evidence that there's more than that going on here. And so how do we make sure that we're not leaving Latinos out? And you know, we don't have to account for every single slice of the demographic pie, but we do need to be a bit more inclusive. And I'm curious from the commenters and others, not only what Jenk and I have been talking about with how do you approach racial dialogue, uh, but how do you expand racial dialogue? I feel very Cornell West, like, how do you expand racial dialogue? Uh, to be more inclusive and acknowledge the changing palette, if you will, of America. So I will toss it back to you from my home studio. Uh, and let's see if, uh, if we can't keep this going. Thanks, and thank you all for your patience. I'm very sorry. A lot going down. And tax day is coming up.